good evening and welcome to bookmark you probably noticed that july that is the month that is just over 2023 was according to scientists the hottest month ever or at least since records began to be kept and some people tell us it's probably the hottest month in the last 12000 years so you will see why i have picked this particular book because it is something to do with the heat that we experienced in the last month in the early 20th century there were some european anthropologists who traveled to remote parts of the globe met societies that seemed very different from european societies and studied them in great detail and some of the things that they reported were astonishing For example we were told that in the Pacific there were small communities basically what you could call hunter gatherer communities which some Europeans described as within quotes savages who <coughs> did not even have in their societies the notion of paternity I just think of that now we might know somebody whose paternity we might have doubts about but we have no doubts about the notion of paternity and here we are anthropologists telling us that there were societies outside europe that had absolutely no notion of paternity imagine a language that did not have the words father why because they did not know that there was a father they had a word for mother they had a word for uncle for siblings etc etc but no notion of paternity now this seemed very very strange i remember reading about this decades ago and wondering if this could be true now i am absolutely convinced that it must be true because of what has been happening lately now when european anthropologists said this they were met with a lot of skepticism but also by people who said yes culture can be so strong that sometimes these things which look natural to us may not be natural so we might think that paternity is something universal but it may not all right so which brings me to today's book and that book is a book by this gentleman called Eugene Linden the book is titled fire and flood a people's history of climate change from 1979 to the present first a word about Eugene Linden he's been writing on nature and remote societies and animal life and extinction and planetary changes and so on for decades he's one of those people who has regularly appeared on the time magazine's cover because he sometimes write these stories which are cover stories he's also written 8 uh, or 10 um, i think more than that books basically on all these issues here is one of them the ragged edge of the world encounters at the frontier where modernity wild lands and indigenous people meet so he's a writer but he's also strangely a venture capitalist he manages a huge fund so in other words he has a perspective on life which does not just come from his reporting and observation of nature and people and animals and trees and so on it also comes from the acumen he has developed as a businessman so he understands reality probably much better than most of us do and this book fire and flood his is his look at global warming today by the early part of the 20th century the industrial revolution was gathering momentum and people in the industrial world were looking for cheap and good forms of fuel coal was driving the industrial revolution but soon they found a better fuel and that was petroleum no in fossil fuel but in liquid form there were various other alternatives being thought of but they were all rejected because this was for various reasons more convenient and cheaper and indeed we have been burning petrol since then and that in a sense ties in wonderfully with the story that linden focuses on which is a story of how greenhouse gases have accumulated in the atmosphere and how we have reached the brink of a catastrophe now 
in 1979 and that's when his story begins when jimmy carter was president of america he took a few steps to ensure that global warming and other changes related to that and the environment could be addressed he spent a lot of energy he set up a few bodies and one of them produced a report which was called the carbon dioxide problem it was delivered by council on environmental quality and that paper attracted a lot of attention because it gave a realistic picture of what was happening the atmosphere was warming if it continued to warm like this in 20 or 30 years the authors of the paper said we would be in great difficulty around 10 years after that actually uh, 1988 james hansen the famous climatologist from america actually addressed the us congress and spoke about the urgency of the problem that we were facing the problem of greenhouse gases now one took place in 1970s late 70s the other in the late 1980s so in spite of society having knowledge about the problems being created by greenhouse gases virtually nothing has been done or if anything has been done these are token actions being taken and what eugene linden wants to examine is the cause for this delay it's almost half a century since we knew about these problems but very little has been done why what has happened we have the knowledge but why is it that we are not doing anything is a question that he is trying to answer in this book so here he focuses on a few things he appears to focus on america but remember he is talking in a sense about the whole world he focuses on america because america is the biggest economy historically they have delivered more greenhouse gases than any other country in the world and they have the ability to change the world if they put their minds to it linden is very confident about that and yet they refuse to do it so that's a question that uh, eugene linden is addressing in the book while doing that he introduces an idea he says imagine four clocks all of them starting in 1979 one of the clocks he says is reality what does he mean by that reality proceeds at at its own pace not really controlled by any of us if you pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere the atmosphere will change and a lot of changes will take place because the atmosphere has changed so reality proceeds at its own pace that's clock number 1 the second clock he says is a science now science tells us that in 1979 there was roughly 335 parts per million co2 in the atmosphere scientists also tell us that now 2023 we have something like 470 parts per million that's a huge increase all right so but there's a problem with science according to uh, <clears throat> linden it's not really a problem he says science always lags behind reality the reality proceeds at its pace science he says is 2 or 3 years behind why is that scientists have to gather evidence they have to analyze it they have to publish papers then they have discussions among themselves so if there are errors pointed out they need to correct so science is not a very quick moving force it is slow it is methodical it is thoughtful and therefore science lags behind reality he says there is a third clock and that clock is about 2 or 3 or 4 decades behind reality it's also behind the science and what is that clock that clock he says is public opinion public opinion he says is largely indifferent to this question he he does look at some of the reasons why it is indifferent but the important thing to remember is that public opinion can if it is strong enough change government policy but it doesn't do that why because it is basically indifferent to the question of climate change and global warming 
I remember Jimmy Carter had tried his best to put scientists in charge. But from the time he lost the election, almost all governments, you know, starting with Ronald Reagan, have been skeptical of science. Although there were a couple of presidents who were a little more confident about what their scientists were telling them. But generally they were skeptical of science. And the last 10 or 20 years, something alarming has happened. What is that? The public have been very hostile to science. You will find that there are more jokes about scientists than there are jokes about politicians. Think of Trump, who when asked about climate change said, yes, the climate will change, the climate has always been changing, and bad mouths scientists all the time because he does not believe in experts. That idea has spread and the public skepticism of science coming from America spreading like a virus to the rest of the world is a phenomenon that is truly astonishing and sometimes extremely alarming. Now, <clears throat> so there is this, there is public opinion which is lagging behind. So when I say lagging behind, what it means is that the public fails to connect their own actions generating greenhouse gases with the resulting extreme weather that we have been witnessing lately. Their ability to connect these two is almost as bad as the ability of the Polynesian Islanders to connect childbirth with an activity that took place a few months back. Alright? So, we are not much better off than those people. The fourth clock is interesting. That clock is business or finance. And Linden tells us business and finance plays a huge role in the world. Indeed, he says it probably plays a part even bigger than public opinion because he says all politicians follow business and finance. Why do they follow business and finance? Simple, that's where the money is. So politicians will speak about public opinion, they will speak about the welfare of the public, but what really drives them are the interests of businessmen. And what have businessmen been doing in the last 30 or 40 years since we knew about climate change? They have been denying it. They have been funding agencies that will produce sign within court scientists who question the findings of the other scientists. So much so that the public catches on to that and say, oh, the science is not settled. We are not sure. Maybe this is just normal, etc., etc. So finance and business are a huge, shall we say, force of reaction, which is preventing governments and the public from moving ahead and enacting policies that might begin to slow climate change. All right. So Lyndon follows all these four clocks and explains why each clock is moving at a particular pace. There's one piece of good news. Towards the end, it looks like one clock is going to move a little faster. And that is the slowest moving clock of all, the finance and business clock. Why is it moving a little faster? In parts of America, he says, particularly California and Florida, it is impossible for property owners to get insurance policies now. Why is that? People in the business of insurance would like to issue the policies, but they won't find a single reinsurer who will insure their insurance. That, he says, is a sign that business is finally beginning to understand the true nature of climate change. And maybe, he says, if business also changes, all the things will begin to change. Now, the surprising thing is that Lyndon closes his book on an optimistic note. He thinks that mankind will somehow surmount this problem and actually tackle climate change. Now, when I look at it, I couldn't agree with him because if the evidence that he has presented is correct and the evidence is obviously correct, it's backed by science, then his conclusions are not warranted. I think Lyndon, like a lot of other people, particularly people from America, suffer from a problem and that is a problem of positive thinking. You have to be optimistic. You have to be positive. Otherwise, it's very bad. If positive thinking means fooling yourself or if it means deluding yourself, then definitely it's not a good thing. But he's so American, like every other American. He thinks that mankind is terrific. We are great innovators. 
we can come up with incredible new technologies and all these problems will be solved but there is very little within the book that seems to tell us that this will actually happen linden does not look at any of the other problems in the environment in this book no for example plastic everywhere in the world the acidification of the oceans and a huge range of things he ignores all of that because for him the most important problem is this particular problem the problem of limiting heating in the atmosphere to 2 degrees he seems to think it will happen but i remember reading james lovelock who says that almost certainly heating will continue till we touch 7 degrees celsius if you reach 7 degrees degrees celsius then i think we will be living in a very 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 different world but that is where polynesian thinking and modern american thinking and indeed worldwide thinking might eventually take us so what's my final message to you well i don't have a message except to say that this book has convinced me that we indians for instance seem to be living in denial of our own role in this linden tells us that china and india could have made a difference could have made a difference they are the leaders in the world today in alternative energy but the fact is india and china are opening new coal mines and generating more greenhouse gases than they ever did and it is far more now than the greenhouse gases being generated in america and europe combined so the future seems to be in the hands of india and china should we be optimistic i don't know i'll let you decide for yourself meanwhile maybe it might be a good idea to get hold of a very good air conditioner thank you